Hello, good morning or good evening, wherever you are joining from in the world to the second of our third season of the Technology, Risk and Gambling webinar series. I'm Sally Gainsbury. I'm Professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Sydney and Director of the Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic and Leader of the Technology Addiction Team within the Brain and Mind Centre, which is sponsoring and bringing us this webinar series. I am really excited for today's topic and I'm happy to be turning it over to my co-host, Dr. Khalil Philander, because this is a topic I want to sit back and take notes, although I may be submitting a few cheeky questions of my own to the panellists. Today, we're going to be talking about big science and big data and how we can use the amazing new technology and analysis that is available and being refined all the time to learn about predicting and responding to risk. And it's going to be a really fascinating conversation. There are lots of questions lined up. So if you have any burning questions, do not wait towards the end. Please pop them into the chat. Uh, please chat amongst yourself. The online community and the live stream is something that we really value. It's the reason our panelists stay up late uh, to, to do this live so please feel free to chat and make use of that functionality. I'm going to hand it over to my co-host Dr Khalil Philander. Hey Sally, uh, so I'm Khalil Philander, I'm uh, Assistant Professor at Washington State University and of course very happy to host this particular session. Um, our speakers this session are Timothy Edson and Spencer Merch, so let me just give their titles very briefly. Uh, Dr. Merch is a postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University. It is his second appearance on the seminar series. Um, so go if you like his talk today, go back and watch his talk from last season. You'll love it too. I think it might have been actually season one. Um, and Dr. Timothy Edson is a research and evaluation scientist at the Cambridge Health Alliance Division on Addiction and an instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. So welcome, Timothy and Spencer. So happy to have you both on the session today. As uh, yeah. Sally alluded to, um, the, the topic of this week is a, a kind of very fancy phrased version of how do we figure out the actual behaviors that exist within um, sort of online data, tra transaction data at an account level. And I think we have two very different um, sets of research that look at that topic um, that are, you know, I think really help illustrate where the field is today in terms of trying to wrap its head around this issue. Um, I know both of our speakers have prepared a few notes on their recent research. So I think what we're going to do for this session is we're going to give each of them um, a few minutes to go over and sort of level set the conversation. Um, and then we're going to come back and uh, loop in more into the sort of back and forth dialogue. So um, I did not say who was going to be presenting first before we uh, started this out, but uh, Spencer looks ready to go. So uh, we'll, we'll give the microphone to Spencer first. So Spencer, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Khalil. And thank you for having me on this. Uh, I'm just going to share slides quickly. Um, and to set the table for this discussion, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that people who gamble online have historically reported significantly elevated risks for experiencing gambling-related harms. Whether there's something inherently more harmful in the structure of online gambling or whether it's due to people's participation in a larger range of gambling activities, uh, I know both Khalil and Sally have papers looking at this, uh, the fact remains that online gambling platforms have traditionally seen a high proportion of people experiencing harm. At the same time, we know that online gambling is gaining popularity right now, especially since the start of the pandemic, more and more people are choosing to gamble online. Here in Quebec, we're also seeing a rapid increase in the number of people signing up for voluntary self-exclusion programs. Online gambling is increasingly popular, and a greater number of people seem to be experiencing harm. My big point here is that existing responsible gambling practices are not adequately addressing the need for harm prevention. As researchers, we need to find new ways to understand the factors that lead people to experiencing harm and to develop new systems that detect and then prevent as much of that harm as possible. So maybe one answer could come from machine learning, a branch of computational statistics and artificial intelligence. Over the last 10 years, several groups of gambling researchers have tried 
using machine learning to detect at-risk online gamblers using patterns of apparent behavior on a particular site or platform. This is a really good reason, uh, a good idea for two reasons. Number one, because machine learning algorithms, of which there are thousands, can sometimes make decisions more accurately and more consistently than any human decision maker could. And number two, a system that accurately detects at-risk people could potentially be used to develop and then deliver more effective and personalized harm prevention materials. So in two pilot studies at the Concordia University Research Chair on Gambling Studies, we aim to determine whether machine learning algorithms can use online gambling site data to retrospectively detect self-reported problem gambling uh, risk levels as they're reported to us on the Problem Gambling Severity Index questionnaire. Now here are the results from the first of those pilot studies. We recruited more than 9,000 online gamblers from the provincial gambling website in Quebec, and we asked them to do two things. First, we asked them to complete that Problem Gambling Severity Index questionnaire. This is a questionnaire that asks about gambling problems occurring in the past year. And second, we asked them to consent for the provincial gambling provider to release their account data to us for the prior 12 months. So the questionnaire that we used looks at the prior 12 months and the data set that we have looks at those same 12 months. We then tested six prominent machine learning algorithms to try and find one that was capable of differentiating PGSI, that's Problem Gambling Severity Index, risk levels, using site data like gambling behavior, financial transactions, and two indicators that we think are approximating loss chasing. And once we selected the best performing machine learning approach, in our case, this was an algorithm uh, called Random Forest that's also worked well in a couple of other gambling studies, uh, one in Europe and one in British Columbia. Uh, we worked then to identify which of the independent variables we uh, tested among 144 of them were responsible for the detection performance that we saw. Now, our system is still in development, and the first paper related to its performance is under review. But I can say for now that the system seems to be working quite well when we test it using previously unseen data. So the models we created correctly identify a large majority of both at-risk participants, that is to say people with PGSI scores greater than or equal to 5 or 8, as well as most lower-risk participants. This shows that our models have learned how to effectively distinguish between PGSI risk categories some of the time. Notably, however, our models seem to have somewhat poorer precision. More than half of the time that our system says it thinks someone is at risk, they actually aren't. So while these machine learning systems could potentially be used for online harm detection, they won't always make the right call. This will have some uh, important implications for how a system like this could be used in the real world. Uh, but from a scientific standpoint, we might like to dig into the results that we have in front of us and try to identify what factors about people's gambling behavior our machine learning models were looking at when they made those decisions. Most of those factors aren't going to surprise you. Uh, they include things like average weekly bet amount, uh, how much that varies from one week to the next. But if we think about the bigger picture here, we could say that our machine learning system provides large scale real world support for experiments in the past that have looked at the behavioral profile of disordered gambling. Going further, future studies could use certain machine learning algorithms to explore what we might call highly dimensional, which is to say really, really big data sets with a whole lot of variables, highly dimensional data sets of gambling behaviors, transactions, and other factors to try and extract complex, multivariate, and importantly, nonlinear trends for the purpose of generating new research hypotheses that we can then test using laboratory experiments. There's so much potential here, and we've only just begun as a field. So with that, uh, I'd like to pass things back to Khalil, uh, and maybe actually Tim next. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. I'll uh, just throw things over to Tim. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks again for having us on the show, uh, Khalil and Sally. Uh, honored to be here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I have a, like a kind of more, maybe more expensive PowerPoint to uh, share. Everyone see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Good, cool. Um, so 
Spencer kind of talked more about machine, like machine learning more generally. But what goes into machine learning algorithms? What goes gambling risk markers tend to go on, go in there. Um, and so I'm going to kind of talk about just one potential gambling risk marker that has been kind of in the conversation in gambling studies for quite a long time. I think it got brought up at last week's episode of this webinar series uh, briefly, talking about the pathways model. Um, and this is big wins. And sometimes people specifically specify early big wins. Um, so big wins have been in the kind of the conversation with gambling studies for quite a long time, um, at least since the, early, the 1960s. Um, and Khalil might laugh because we tried to feature this um, episode in our first paper. Um, full, full disclosure that Khalil has been heavily involved on this big wins research with uh, me and the rest of the division. Um, so big wins have been kind of been the general idea for quite a while. Um, the Twilight Zone featured in its first season, 1960, featured a guy going into a casino, no interest in gambling, but then his wife tells him to play the slot machine. He puts in a, you know, a, a penny or a quarter and wins a bunch of them, he gets a big win. And now all of a sudden he's hooked, he's in his hotel room that night and just needs to go back to the slot machine to repeat that experience. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of the big win effect in gambling. And it's kind of has its, and then it started having its clinical or started becoming really clinically important from the observation of Robert Custer, um, an early uh, gambling clinician, who mentioned that gamblers invariably have a history of a big win. The big win establishes in the mind of the gambler that it can happen, it could happen again. And that after a big win, the amount of money bet and bet escalates and significantly with the anticipation of still larger wins. Then there's the losing streak that is difficult to tolerate. Since the gambler is betting much more heavily, the winning pool is quickly depleted. To get even, he will bet with sources of money that he may, may, not, have earned, may, not, may not have earned. He could have uh, been loaned it. So I think it's kind of following that same general idea that the pathways model kind of, um, kind of uh, proposes that you get this early experience and now lead you on a path to gambling problems. So that's the big win effect in that social presentation mode. So you kind of just, first we tried to had to figure out how do we even define a big win? It's life changing money, right? Which is a, can be a lot of money. You know, you're thinking lottery style wins, but if you look at actual gambling data, no one's really going to have those humongous wins. Usually, you're not going to get enough of a sample. Um, a large so a large amount of money is one way to look at it. Um, for example, risking $10,000 and winning $20,000. So that's a decent amount of money. That's only two times what you actually risk, though. So looking at a large amount of money is one way. You can also look at it as a large multiplier. For example, even though it's small money, risking $1 and winning $20, which is 20 times what you, what you wagered. So that's another way to look at it. It's multiplic multiplicative. And then you have to look at, is it a single bet or hand? So the time frame, like, what is it as a single bet or hand that you're looking at for the big win? Like uh, the example I showed. Um, it could be a whole gambling session um, that you're looking at, um, whereas maybe you had a bunch of bunch of wins that you need to add up. Or you could be looking at it as a multi-day winning streak. So there's a bunch of answers of how you even define a big win. So our first attempt at studying big wins, which might be in the division addiction, addiction work of Khalil on, we took, we took three cohorts of daily fantasy sports players, 12,041 of them, who made their accounts and um, on this website DraftKings during August 2013, 2014, and 2015. And for each player in contests, we had the date and time, the amount spent in entry fees, and the amount won in prizes. Um, this is a very NFL-centric co uh, cohort of, of, DF of daily fantasy sports, which I'm going to acronym to DFS many times, uh, players. So they're very interested in the National Football League games. Um, over 40% of the 2014 cohort was NFL only. So they were very um, NFL centric. Why do we look at daily fantasy sports? Um, well, first of all, the schedules and payouts like those are like those of traditional gambling like poker tournaments. It involves wager on the outcome of sporting events like sports betting. And first of all, was, I mean, probably the most, foremost reason, the most recent data we had at the time that was at that contest bet by bet level. So to actually look at real gambling um, behaviors and outcomes, you really want to have that bet by bet level, which wasn't available in many cases up to that point. And then defining big win within these data. So our first definition was an absolute dollar one. Um, so Custer's clinical observations, he used kind of loose guidance, one year's salary as a benchmark. So that would be what he would consider a big win. His uh, colleague Milton him mentioned the size of win in comparison to an individual, individual's annual earnings. 
And then a recent, um, a, a more recent um, uh, study suggested one month salary. So we went with a threshold of $1,000. So basically we took the discretionary income, which is something for most people on a given month, which for most people is a little bit under a thousand and rounded it up to a thousand given the idea of like maybe round number of bias. So we ended up at a thousand dollars is like kind of our threshold for the absolute dollar definition of big win. And the second definition was the prize ratio. This is kind of our own definition where basically you find the highest amount spent on a single contest up to the get that week. Um, we chose weeks because NFL is a week by week thing. And then we take um, the win and divide that prize by this maximum spend to get the quotient that is the prize ratio. So for example, that $20 and $1 bet, that'd be a 20X prize ratio. And we called it a big win if it was in the top 1% of prize ratios. So using these two definitions, we had an analytic sample of 34,596. Um, the study period that we looked at was between August 1st and December 26, 2016. And the minimum prior ratio for big win that we found was 10.93, so 10.93 times your entry fee, um, or your large entry fee up to that point. And the analytic big win roster, um, so we made some decisions on how you could actually qualify as a big winner. Well, first of all, we decided you had to have 24 weeks available after the big win to monitor how you, um, how you bet, how you wager after the big win compared to somebody. Um, you can't have a second big win within those 24 weeks. You can't be a repeat big winner. And that's an important point. I'll, 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 I'll loop back that in a second. So in the end, we had 3,335 big winners. So we started with that big sample, 34,000, whittled it down to 3,335 3, people who actually experienced a big win. And this included about close under, under 2,000 big winners by prize ratio definition about 1,000 by both criteria and 464 big winners by just the absolute dollar criterion. So let's look at some head com comparisons. So we used to, so our main analytical technique was match pair analysis. We found other individuals that had a similar experience of big winners, except without the big win. So we took those big winners and found up to the week of the big win, what, were there any players who didn't win a big win, but had similar, not similar betting behavior, similar how much they spend in entry fees, similar um, cumulative net loss up to that period. Um, and, we try, and, we used, um, match pair, and we used match pairs to basically choose the best pairing for, the, for those individuals. And we matched them on dollars spent on entry fees, cumulative net loss, and number of entries. And compared big winners to their matches on DFS activity in the weeks and months after the big win. And thanks to uh, Matt Tom, who's I think is in the chat room for putting this the template for this slide deck together. He shows the movie Twins to kind of demonstrate that. So you have these people who are basically just like one another, but then something happens that makes them diverge, that makes them, that sends them down different paths. And that what we, what we suggested was the big win. So we compared the match controls to the big winners the week after the big win. And we found that big winners entered more contests, spent more on entry fees, and most, perhaps most importantly, experienced greater net losses. Um, we also looked at whether, so we looked at this the week after the big win. We also looked at this 24 weeks after the big win. So up to 24 weeks, we looked at just, we compared these same players again and again, for up to 24 weeks to see if, does the big win effect state, like, is it remain over time or does it, you know, get weaker or just disappear entirely? So we kind of graphed this and we saw that the absolute effects, the effects of absolute dollar big wins weaken, but never went away within that 24 week period. Um, prize ratio big wins weakened and eventually disappeared after several weeks. And then finally, I've always spoken at this point of just big win effects, but a lot of people talk about it as an early big win effect. That's not really very important unless it happens early on in the gambler's experience, which is kind of how a lot of people have looked at it. Um, again, we're looking at one operator here. We can only, so we can't look at the individual's entire gambling experience and look at their earliest big win. We only have their big win with this particular product to this particular operator. So we're limited in how we can test this, but we still looked at whether the week of the big win, looking at just big winners had a, had a bigger, do, do earlier weeks or, or big wins during earlier weeks have a stronger effect on subsequent engagement than ones that happened during later weeks. And what we found was somewhat surprising. Week of big win did have a small but weak effect, but it was a later, it was later wins that actually had the stronger effect. But Again, a very weak effect and not something we were like, 
no, this is, you know, this isn't, uh, this is humongous news. That means there's a late big one effect. No, we didn't say that. There's just, it's just that I think we think that the time, at least within operators, doesn't really matter. So, what are the takeaways from this from this uh, research? Well, we identified big win effects among daily fantasy sports players in terms of increased engagement, including increased losses. But increased engagement, even losses, does not automatically equal harm. Um, we did not look at, for example, whether um, whether these whether big winners actually got net losses that chewed through their big win and actually put them into a state of net loss. We even actually did, uh, did explore, uh, an exploratory analysis looking at big winners compared to match controls on, on um, self-exclusion data that we had from um, DraftKings. So we saw whether big wins were actually associated with self-exclusion and their findings were basically null. Um, big, win, big winners did not, were not more likely to self-exclude compared to match controls um, and with self-exclusion being a proxy for potential gambling harm. Um, there was a strong and deterioration a dissip dissipation effect of the big wins over time, which suggests that maybe some of the causal mechanisms behind big wins, for example, um, house money effects or operant conditioning could be coming into play since those, uh, those same kind of mechanisms would be expected to, to deteriorate over time if the experience is not repeated. Um, we found that repeat big wins could be more so a sign of skill rather than potential harm. And this kind of shows that not all big wins are equal. If there's not someone who maybe be skill, is skilled with this activity, could that, is, are those people really at harm? Um, an interesting anecdote that Khalil Khan remembers is that he, his kind of big contribution was doing fixed effects analysis as a sensitivity analysis. And he didn't find in the fix, so that's taking all of the data and kind of just looking at whether big wins are associated with these, with these variables, with, these, um, with increased engagement and losses using all the players. And he found that, it didn't have an effect on that losses. And we're like, wait, why are we seeing divergent results here? And then we remembered that in match pairs, we excluded repeat big winners. And so we asked Khalil to do the same with his fixed effects. And when he excluded them, he found that big wins had an effect, had an effect on increased net losses over time. So it was the repeat big winners who were making the difference there, which shows that potential skill is, um, plays a part in this. And then finally, the jury is kind of still out on whether the timing of big wins actually matters. And I don't think we can really answer that question fully unless we have the breadth of the entire gambler's gambling history to look at that earliest big win and see whether it has an effect on engagement. Um, in terms of implications, especially as it relates, so safer play messaging. I think operators can, can, can and should, when someone experiences a big win by some definition of theirs, Send them a message. Hey, you just want a big win, great. Maybe you should potentially withdraw some of that big win, not all of it, maybe some of it, and allocate some of it to other things, other like pursuits, maybe your savings. So there's already some responsible gambling messages we can, we can suggest with this type of research. But now looking at big wins as a problem gambling marker as part of an algorithm. Is it a problem gambling marker? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, big wins by themselves could mean many things, including potential skill. Um, big wins plus something else though. For example, no withdrawal afterwards, no repeat big wins, losses that exceed and go dip into even further met losses after the big win could mean problems that included among a battery of promising markers. And then in terms of next steps for this, uh, we're currently applying these same procedures to a large sample of online sports bettors, um, including Khalil's has been helping out with that. Um, I've linked to the, um, pre the preprint here, but the, hopefully the published paper will be out fairly soon. So we're excited for that. And that is it for me. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Um, um, there we go. Uh, so uh, I just want to jump on one thing there, Spencer. I saw you kind of laugh when <laughs> Tim suggested uh, the safer gambling message about withdrawing for once you've uh, had a big win. Is that a laugh of skepticism or? Uh, an enlightenment laugh. Um, I I think yeah. I th I think uh, if I can set the record straight, I I smiled very wide uh, when Tim suggested that. Um, I think it's I think it would be a terrific idea. Um, I think it would certainly mitigate uh, losses. We know um, we know that there's that sort of house money effect in play where it, it seems a little bit less real if you've not held it in your hand, if it's something that's been sort of endowed to you by something like a big win. Um, I, uh, I do admit I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about 
uh, whether an operator would want to uh, put such a thing in place. But if they could be convinced to do so, I think it would be a terrific idea. Without naming names, I do know of operators that do already do that. Well, excellent. That's great. I can't name them. So. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> I will admit that. <laughs> you can probably <laughs> um, That's interesting. I, so um, this is kind of related to, I guess, my first question, which is, um, so like these learning algorithms um, have kind of been the flying cars of gambling research in particular online gambling research, where it's like something that we've been promised is going to come for like literally now decades. Um, and it's not obvious to me that we've seen much in terms of its impact uh, on operations. Like to me, you know, like if I look at it, you know, if you see like a customer's just, you know, spent five, six figures on your site, you probably could do most of the interventions that we've seen people do already. Um, I think there's a great study. Uh, I'm forgetting all of the authors on it, so I won't mention any author specifically, but it was about calling people who might be in the higher risk category and, and doing an intervention that way. Um, but Spencer, so you mentioned that um, in your system, it was sort of lacking in precision and that has some implications. So that, like, where do you see how you could say what you're working on or what other people are working on similar problems, like how can that still be helpful or, or what are the sort of implications for your system? That's a terrific question. Thank you. Was it, um, was it uh, Jacob Janssen's paper in, in Sweden for the, yeah, the, the right. step, yeah. the stepped intervention model. Actually, that's, um, that's a terrific point that kind of dovetails really nicely. Um, if we consider the predictions that we make about whether someone is having uh, experiencing harms associated with their gambling, whether that's in terms of the raw expenditure on the site, which um, based on my results, I would think would be quite a reasonable indicator to look at if you had to pick one in isolation, um, or whether you have some kind of uh, machine learning based system or, or sophisticated model of some kind that's making predictions and then handing you the predictions that it's making. The biggest question in all of that is once you have this information, what do you do with it? Um, and I, I think from that same paper, if you have sort of a, a, a stepped system where you start to look at multiple factors and as they pile up, um, you can make decisions about whether to involve more and more uh, serious interventions. I think that's a, a terrific idea. So in in my case, for example, I have one model that predicts the likelihood that somebody reports a PGSI score of eight or greater, which puts them uh, in a validated risk category that would be considered generally high risk. And then I have another model that does a bit of an earlier threshold where it tries to predict if somebody is in that high risk group, or if alternatively, they're in a moderate risk group where their score is between five uh, and eight on the PGSI. So in some cases, if you employ both of those models in tandem, you'll have a prediction that's made reasonably well uh, that somebody is at least moderate risk, but may not necessarily be high risk yet. At that point, the decision that you would make might be different from the decision that you would make about somebody who's clearly providing a lot of indication that they're at high risk. So you could, at the lowest level, an operator could just automatically stop sending promotional materials to someone's email inbox. Uh, from there, you could start encouraging them to decrease their spending limits that are set on the site if the site does have such a thing. After that, you could start encouraging them to look into voluntary self-exclusion. Uh, if you're in a jurisdiction where such a thing would be considered socially permissible, you could start calling people on the phone to see if something's wrong. Uh, and you can kind of get the sense that over time, these interventions ratchet up in terms of uh, what they imply in terms of the behavioral change that a person is going to have to make uh, or or may choose to make. Yeah, and I think um, like to some, I, I think that that approach makes a lot of sense. Part of the I think challenges operationally is um there's not a lot of evidence that kind of uh 
interventions at sort of a lower scale actually are helpful. Um, but maybe that's part of the learning model is, is, you know, like once we start to have interventions at lower risk levels, um, then we might, we might be actually able to see in the data that that keeps people at lower risk levels. Um, I think that the problem with responsible gambling is like, there's sort of one thing that's been rigorously shown to be helpful, which is self-exclusion. And then like everything else, it's like, you know, sometimes it helps on some outcome variables, but probably not really that strong effects. Um, and even then voluntary self-exclusion uh, has an issue with frequent violation. Yeah, it can for sure. Sure. Tim, I don't but, know if you yeah. want to jump in on that or do you want me to? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned voluntary self-exclusion. Like, um, Spence, did you say you use voluntary self-exclusion in any of your research? I thought I caught you saying that somewhere. Um, yes. So that's uh, in terms of how these models were fit. Um, we looked at a number of different factors. Uh, I think 18 of them related to the built-in uh, data that the operator had about someone's use of responsible gambling, uh, quote unquote, responsible gambling tools on the site. Um, so that includes things like uh, where they set their deposit limits, if they set a loss limit or a time limit. And it also includes uh, any history on that account of pauses, uh, which are sort of a short term voluntary self-exclusion, and then in the longer term, actual voluntary self-exclusion orders. The interesting thing, though, in the models uh, that we have is that these factors uh, didn't end up surviving factor reduction, which is to say that the 10 variables I showed on screen uh, were the ones that ended up being used by our, our uh, what, what you would call a hungry algorithm to create the best fitting model. So while these RG tools are used in some cases, uh, the model was capitalizing on different information in order to make its decisions about people. Gotcha. Interesting. And um, and I think a lot of the questions right now with algorithms is like, you know, you, for number one, the thresholds, like some like the thresholds of contingencies, like you can like for your the markers you met, can you just, if you trip one of them, is that like enough to like start you know intervening with someone, or do you have to trip multiple of them, or is it some sort of combination, or and does and does the uh, machine learning algorithm kind of tell you that, or do you have to like play around and see what has the best sensitivity and specificity? Um, the, yeah. Again, unlike Spencer, I haven't had as much experience of actually getting my feet wet with actual um, using algorithms. So I'm kind of going to this half blind. Um, no, these the are, these are terrific questions. Uh, yeah. you, you've asked are... you've asked the million dollar question, uh, and you've done it you've done it twice there. Um, so one of them. Uh, one of the key topics here that will be important, not just from uh, a data science standpoint, but also uh, from a machine learning fairness and equity and accountability standpoint is the transparency of these systems. So how do they arrive at the decisions that they make about a person, especially if that has implications for their health, for their finances? Um, and so in the case of the algorithms that we used. So the, a random forest is essentially like procedurally creating a, a big flow chart and then doing so over and over again, 500 times in our case, and then averaging out the predictions that they make about a person. Um, you can get the statistics I showed on screen, which are called feature importance. Uh, and they, they essentially reflect how each factor contributed uh, to those different flow charts and what proportions. But you're right, without pouring over 500 flowcharts, you wouldn't know exactly how a decision was reached about a person. And you end up in a little bit of a, a sort of black box situation where you have decisions being reached and you don't know precisely how it was uh, arrived at. And it's a little bit different from the logic of something like uh, a linear regression, where you have a set of weights that you can clearly see which factors were applied in what proportions to a particular person to arrive at a particular prediction. Uh, so in, the, in this case, I um, it wouldn't be the case in this specific algorithm that one fat that tripping one uh, factor or coming in at a particular score on one factor would be enough to reach a classification just because the algorithm itself runs through these long uh, and often convoluted flow charts. But you're right, you're right to wonder. Um, how these things will be explained to people, uh, how how we will exercise oversight in their functioning, and what that's going to mean for the next generation of harm prevention initiatives. 
So on, like, on that question of explaining things to people, um, I, I think it might be a helpful exercise, Tim, if you could talk about how you think about the idea of a big win and then how you operationalized it in the study, um, like around $1,000. Um, and then if, if you want to talk about like how that might fit into like a, a future um, behavioral model, I mean, you're welcome to make that extension or Spencer, you can jump in too. But um, I think that would be like a really helpful illustration of how we get from um, hypothesis to theory to something that's actually useful um, for predicting behavior. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, with big wins, like, we, um, when we operate, so we operationalize it as $1,000. And first of all, I want to say that, you know, $1,000 top 1% 1 of price ratios, those are just what we chose. Um, they were the, they were our best effort to operationalize customers loose guidance on what qualifies the big win. And the top 1% threshold of the price ratios was based on you know, my organization vision on addictions, epidemiological descriptions of gambling activity, where we found that the top 1% tended to exhibit more outsized engagement than the bottom 99%. However, these thresholds are certainly not set in stone and we can allocate, and we allocate limitations in that as such in our papers. Um, and we also entertain the idea that it's, that it might not just be a big win that's, um, that makes a difference. Um, but assuming that a big win does make a difference, that it is just the single win that's of some specific threshold. Um, as I kind of mentioned at the end of my presentation, I wouldn't consider a big win by itself to be, to really, right at this point, to qualify for an algorithm because it just can mean so many things. It can mean, I mean, I didn't mention, it can mean someone who's skilled, first of all, and who has the bank role to allocate to, allocate to um, you know, gambling more. Um, so it could be a sign of skill. It could be just a sign that someone is gambling, has a lot of money. Um, for thousand like a thousand dollars means a lot to me, but for like an, for an actual like a like a professional athlete, that's Tuesday, you know. Um, so that might not be mean much for them. And that's that's kind of the issue too with like you know with these algorithms of just like having gambling engagement measures with no financial information about the person, not knowing what their means to gamble is. Um, which is kind of, I think, going to be the big challenge with algorithms moving forward. I don't know, Spencer, if you had any kind of insight on on that yourself about the kind of that just the finance. If we don't know the financial part of it, do we know we only know half the half the question? Yeah, this is this is um, this is terrific, and and I I might want to throw things back to you really quickly because it dovetails with a question that I had during your presentation. Um, your presentation and and you've mentioned a couple of times about uh games of skill versus chance right your data sets are involving sports betters predominantly one of the things uh that i thought might be really interesting uh and i'm interested to get your take on is if you could look at an activity that um if we look at something like uh art reber's expected value flexibility model he would say is sort of an unskilled game compared to something like daily fantasy sports so if you could have a comparator group just hypothetically speaking of, of lottery gamblers um, do you think you see the same effects? And uh, if not, why not? Yeah, so we're, I mean, right now, we're, as I mentioned, we're applying this to, sport, to online sports betting, which is, you know, still a game of, of online sports betting is partial skill, depends on the type of bet you mean. I think a 15 leg parlay is definitely, you're basically throwing it up in the air and hoping Lady Luck lands in your favor, unless you really know what you're doing. Um, so you could say this, that could be partially unskilled activity. And without going into details, we do see the same, um, basically the same results of online sports betting. Um, with that said, if I, if I had bet by bet level um, EGM data and applied these same methods there, would I see a big win effect still? Yeah, probably because um, as much as there's an, like a illusion of control was kind of one of the potential explanations for big win effect. This idea that, oh, I, I won because I totally know what I'm doing. Someone easily just to say, oh, I won because I'm a lucky person. And this and this must happen a lot. So you got like, you know, availability, heuristic, all these types of cognitive biases go into play. That can still go into play even when it's a luck-based activity. That said, we have not um, applied this to a completely luck-based activity like EGMs, which I hope happens pretty soon because obviously in that Twilight, Twilight Zone episode I first introduced, that's when the first big win effect. I, mean, I think EGMs is where people first thought about the big win originally. So um, it'd be interesting to see how it, um, how it comes out there, especially since EGMs often, they probably give big wins more than 
more than most other products. So yeah, you probably get a little bit of a cleaner effect too, because you wouldn't have the professionals kind of muddying the data. Um, oh yeah, like exactly. Oh yeah, exactly. Daily fantasy yeah. sports stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. I will just go into an anecdote for a second. I did. I was at um a batch. I was at a bachelor party at Foxwoods. And I did, I, I, paid, I may have played a couple games of blackjack because I don't really do the GMs, but uh, someone else who was there um, did play the AGMs and he got, you know, a lot of winnings. And I just remember that he like got up, he like ha- got a lot of winnings, got up the next morning because he wanted to go back and try to win again. And I think he bought them though. So there's an anecdotal example of big fan of AGMs. Um, I'm going to go to the chat here for um, the next question. Um, so... This happened about 30 minutes ago, but Eric Lauterbach asked about, or mentioned that it was interesting that the, for you, Spencer, that most bets in one day was the most important and maybe that proxied overall time involvement. I, I guess I'm just gonna ask a little bit more of a general question um, sort of related to that is like, like, you know, if you play for more time then you're probably spending more money. And, you know, if you bet a lot on Tuesday you probably bet a lot on Saturday. And, you know, like, it seems to me like there's, at least in, in what we've seen in the academic research so far, a lot of these variables are almost identical um, in some ways, like the correlation with them, I would expect is, is pretty strong. It, that's just kind of my general intuition. Um, do you think that's true? Where do you sort of see um, sort of novelty in the data? Uh, maybe I'll leave it there and I, may, I might ask a follow-up question. Yeah, uh, this is a terrific question. Um, so from the from the first question, um, uh, the indicator of most bets in one day as a proxy of time involvement, I think I think is an interesting and valid interpretation of this. One one wrinkle to that, uh, or actually two wrinkles to that interpretation are the graph I showed um, is an indicator of feature importance in a random forest algorithm, which without going into it, um, has a number of things that can bias it a little bit in some interesting ways. So it's, um, I might say it's in leagues with the top five things that are on that chart, but it's not clearly head and shoulders above the rest. Um, you couldn't really test something like statistical significance to see which one was the best in, in that kind of, uh, environment. Um, I would say, though, uh, in that model, um, we removed factors that were highly collinear, highly uh, correlated with each other earlier on in the analysis phase. So this included things like our our statistics ended up being the ones that were mean-based, even though we did also look at median-based statistics for the same indicators. Uh, The correlations between them were very high. This can make problems for certain algorithms. like a random forest, uh, like linear regression. Uh, so those things were kicked out. So anything that we do have uh, does not have an inordinately high correlation with other things uh, that you saw in that chart. But I would, uh, I would mention it's it it's kind of interesting, uh, as you say, that we get this um, this relationship. It almost looks like a dose response relationship between more gambling involvement is more risk of harm. Um, and that certainly, I think, has some impacts on current uh, advertising approaches, right? If if my model has as its dependent variable somebody's PGSI score, their problem gambling risk level that they've reported, self-reported about the past 12 months, and someone else's very similar model has as their dependent variable uh, whether or not somebody would come back and bet more if we sent them a promotion to their email inbox. Um, there's really, I'm seeing this kind of tight coupling between uh, indicators that we think are important for classifying risk and indicators that are useful for identifying financial involvement in these activities. So I think from a maybe a public health standpoint, uh, there's quite an impetus for looking deeper into this and deciding if uh, if current practices for, say, identifying people for specialized promotions uh, are capitalizing on people who are at risk disproportionately. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, um, one of the things that strikes me is, is, um, 
like I, I don't know what what the right way forward would be if I was working on a project like you are or if I was working in an organization um, that was going down this path is the idea of like some algorithms work really well with completely unstructured data and just finding the relationships. So like you might feed it um, uh, like, you know, like if we feed it, it, fed it daily data, it might find that an early big win was important. Um, and then like some models work really well for when we know that there's like a defined relationship between um, certain features and then outcomes. Um, and we kind of like the research that exists right now, we're kind of splitting the difference where we're saying like, okay, we have this theory that suggests that um, things like chasing losses are really important for identifying people that have problems. And, you know, like maybe that goes back to, you know, the conversation we had last week about the pathways model. Um, but are, do you think like, and this is a question for both of you, and neither of you have to answer the question because it's not really a great question. Do you think we're, <laughs> we're approaching this problem the right way? I, like for me, it feels like we've made a lot of marginal improvements over the past sort of 10, 15 years that people have been doing this type of research. And uh, like, I, it's not clear to me that we um, are on the right path. So like, I guess, do either of you feel that that's the case? And if so, like, what do you think is is needed to make a leap forward? What might be a, a reasonable path to pursue to make a leap forward in this space? I mean, I can give you the more cynical. <laughs> so, um, but I think of like a place where like, I think algorithms have been, I think are becoming, I mean, from what I'm reading kind of off, offhand are becoming accessible is predicting physical health outcomes like cancer diagnosis. I see news articles all the time that algorithms are, are doing miracles right now for predicting risk factors for cancer. But I think we have to be upfront that, you know, we're not predicting a physical health outcome that's, a man, that's manifest. You know, you can see, I mean, with, with certain like um, imaging uh, capability, can see cancer. But with, with problem gambling, you know, you're, I mean, let's, let's how, do we, how do I say this? Um, so you're kind of depending on the person's self-report about, you know, even like Spencer's PGSI, like someone has to admit that they have, are having these problems. And that's going to be, that's going to be a problem because, um, you know, just taking like, you know, um, social desirability bias into account, how many people want to admit to other people that they have gambling problems or they're taking out like major loans to fund their gambling? Um, how many people want to admit that to others, let alone to themselves? So how many like potential pr problem gamblers are we missing with these algorithms? So I think we have to be able to keep those limitations in mind as we approach algorithms that we're not we're kind of always going to be kind of a step down from physical health algorithms who have a clear outcome that don't have as many false positives or negatives. Um, so I think that's kind of the important point to keep in mind. With that said, I think we should still pursue it, keeping those limitations in mind and not try to say that we're going to be able to do one as record. We're going to have these limitations um, going forward. Uh, so Spencer, I'll, let, I'll give you the floor on what you think about it. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's uh, a, a number of, um, there's a number of valid points there. I would um, I would push back just a little bit on um, the 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 PGSI characterization, um, suggesting that uh, that these it, it of course is valid to say that these are subject to self report biases, uh, and there is good, uh, well done validation research on the PGSI to show, uh, particularly its its sensitivity to detect uh, people who are uh showing signs of being at risk on other diagnostic instruments uh but you're 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 right that there are uh there are important limitations on what these tools can do um but i i would suggest that rather than thinking of uh, a binary of of whether or not to use these in service of uh, personalized harm prevention initiatives. The the question uh, that we might pose instead would be understanding all of the faults that are inherent here, understanding that something like voluntary self-exclusion, if that's your outcome variable rather than a, a questionnaire, understanding that that's an imperfect proxy of gambling-related harm, what can we do with the information that it does tell us, right? Keeping, keeping in mind that there are... Uh, discovery-based predictions that we make 
uh, for the service of, of understanding in the long term what disordered gambling, what uh, gambling related harm looks like. And then separating that from the question of in the short term, how can we best use the data that we have access to to make robust predictions about what sorts of tools might be effective? Uh, and I, I'd mention as well, if you want to uh, talk about it, we could go into um, some of the ways that these technologies could be used to develop and then assess the effects of new interventions, understanding that previous uh, responsible gambling interventions have not all been effective across the board. Yeah, I think that's like a, a thing worth digging into. I think it also relates to Eric's second question about how to collect um, PG data on a, a regular basis. That's kind of like a tactical question. Um, and I know uh, PlayScan did something like that. It wasn't um, necessarily like a validated scale like the PGSI. Um, uh, any thoughts? Like having, I, I know both of you have worked with, you know, um, private organizations that um, are like semi private, I guess it would be public for you, Spencer, but um, with the industry on this problem, have you thought about data collection mechanisms that might be more helpful for your research? Hey, yeah. Um, I mean, we, our organization is trying to kind of do kind of what Spencer does, you know, collect survey data um, for gamblers and link them with their gambling records. Um, it's been tough. There, there, there's a lot of resistance from the industry um, for multiple reasons. I mean, many of them are skittish about potentially um, reaching out and asking their VIPs, especially about gambling problems. And there's also becoming, even if they want to, there's becoming um, issues with uh, data sharing regulations. Uh, GDPR is entering the, which is the European, don't ask me what that stands for, I keep forgetting. But it's the European um, gambling, uh, just European data sharing, which is goes way beyond gambling. And that's made, that's just made the lawyers kind of get in between of the idea of sending a player survey and trying to ask people about, you know, any sort of uh, problem gambling measure or um, their financial data, which is kind of what I think you need to really, um, to really get a good algorithm going. That's is that like, um, sorry to interrupt, is that the right, so I, I think people's sort of dream data set is one where you have basically on an hour by hour basis, someone's like current PGSI score so that you can map that against, you know, their, <laughs> their behavior. Um, it, it strikes me that like the sensitivity specificity of the PGSI score in general is like low 80s, something like that. Um, like could like a, a good algorithm outperform that? Like, are, are we trying to tune our models to the wrong outcome variable? Um, or is it just, it's the only thing that we have and we're familiar with and it's validated? Um, or should we like, would like a, an unstructured approach actually make more sense, do you think intuitively? That's a, a terrific question. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind, as you say, that uh, the quality of predictions you're able to make is going to be pretty tightly coupled to the level of measurement error that exists in your dependent variable. Uh, so if if the PGSI, and, and depending on which paper you look at, its sensitivity is uh, maybe in the 80s, maybe lower than that, um, its ability to detect at-risk people as measured by other diagnostic instruments is not perfect. Um, and so we understand going in that even if people are perfectly honest on these surveys, which in an anonymous survey and in large sample research, they tend to be quite good, I think, um, you still potentially have issues where you hit a performance ceiling that's short of perfect sensitivity, perfect specificity, perfect precision. Um, this kind of comes up against what I mentioned earlier, which is understanding that these predictions will not be perfect. How do we make sure that they can be robust for the tools we plan to use them with, right? Um, you bring in issues of when precision is imperfect, you bring in issues of trustworthiness. So uh, if somebody gambles uh, regularly on, on a site and then reports a low PGSI score, but yet they keep getting messages in their inbox saying, hey, we think you have a high PGSI score. Um, 
that mismatch across many people could reduce trust in the system overall. Similarly, a system that's uh, missing people who are at high risk or um, in some cases misclassifying people at lower risk, that system will have inherent limits on uh, its ability to be effective and what people even, you know, whether people want to have anything to do with it. And so, again, this level of um, transparency and openness with respect to how the system functions, I think, is going to be critical in the next uh, in the next phase of the development of these tools. Okay, let me, I, we're almost out of time here. So I'm just gonna ask one more quick question. Um, if you could uh, kind of wave your magic wand, what do you think would benefit uh, researchers the most to have in this space, this research topic? What would you like to see, say in the next three to five years change, whether it's something in the industry or, or whether it's data availability and you can't say more funding? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, Khalil, I think when you first mentioned this question, I think one thing you mentioned was pooled data across operators. Um, that's a constant limitation in our research we have to keep pointing to is that we only have data from one operator. Um, and it makes sense, right, that you want pooled data. There's There might be a lot of individuals who don't trip a single operator's marker rate, a single operator's marker threshold, but would have done so if you looked at all of their gambling activity. Um, there's also a lot of research out there um, suggesting that many, if not most online gamblers have more than one account. So that's even more reason that you really want to try to get pooled data. But it's probably going to be pretty difficult to get pooled data. Um, it can really, really be accomplished, I think, by getting as many operators as possible to, agree to send their data to some sort of protected repository that standardizes it and only researchers have access to and has a unique ID linking between all the data. It'd be even better, and probably it's more of a pipe dream to get brick and mortar casinos to actually collect data by requiring a gambling card use and then having them send to that same repository, then you really have a person's um, all their gambling data. Maybe actually might be able to see that first early big win um, accurately. Um, and then another thing, as I mentioned previously, is just an ability to regularly get individuals' financial data, which I think can really um, bring out the next level because then you can actually look at their means. Um. I, I would say the thing that I hope emerges over the next few years uh, is a couple of things and they're related. Um, equity in the form of assessing these systems, uh, not just about how they do for a typical participant or somebody who's well represented in the training data, the data set that you create your model from, uh, but for people from various sociodemographic backgrounds, uh, different uh, levels of financial well-being. Uh, things like that. I think equity is going to be actually a huge topic uh, when it comes to how these systems can actually be used in the real world. The next uh, piece that goes along with that is context. Um, I think context is going to be incredibly important for making algorithms that function well in particular contexts, in jurisdictions, on specific websites. Uh, I'm a little bit dubious, although the technology is advancing fast and I've seen really impressive things lately. I'm a little bit dubious about turnkey solutions created in one jurisdiction and transplanted into the next to make predictions about at-risk people. Their performance, I think, needs to be very carefully scrutinized uh, by people within that jurisdiction to make sure that the system is doing what it says that it's doing. Uh, and that brings me to the third point, which is accountability. At the level of all autonomous systems, I think it's ethically imperative that we build in human accountability so that if somebody receives or importantly doesn't receive some health relevant intervention that other people are receiving, there can be a name or a process associated with uh, accountability to ensure that that doesn't keep happening. And I hope that those are the things uh, that come about in this area of sort of the data science gambling field in the next few years. With all of them in place, I'm optimistic uh, that we'll be able to really uh, honestly engage with the idea of operators and jurisdictions' duty of care in addressing gambling-related harms. Awesome. Those are both uh, really great answers um, covering very different aspects of, of the space, but both very important. Um, so 
Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Edson and Dr. Merch, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we could have talked for another couple of hours, but um, alas, we must end this talk here now. So I will pass the conversation back over to Sally to tell us about what we have next week. Thank you very much. I, I was really glad at the end that we circled around to the topic of ethics and equality and equity and, and transparency with increasing looking at technology like blockchain and uh, moving away from potentially regulation to putting things back into customers' hands and, and how uh, those ethical issues are so important. It's as the gambling field somewhat playing catch up and still in its relatively early days at looking at things like machine learning and AI, we need to heed lessons from other industries and ensure that we're having these conversations about ethics and equity uh, and considering co-design rather than building a system and then seeing what happens afterwards. So not actually something I've read or heard much about and, and a critically important important points to to pick up on so thank you uh thank you Khalil thank you Tim thank you Spencer what a fascinating conversation I'm definitely going to listen back on it because I didn't pick up on everything there was so much going on I need to have another listen and really think through these points and I appreciate you sharing particularly those early unpublished data findings that is a real scoop so thank you so much for that and I'll take the liberty of saying that your email addresses are probably publicly available for anyone that wants to contact you so please do follow up with with Spencer and Tim and thank you for sharing your expertise thank you Khalil for hosting please join us next week we are going to be talking about youth gambling, which is uh, an, an always important topic. And I'm specifically not going to define how um, what age group that refers to because that will be a point for the, for the show. But we will be joined with uh, expert Professor Jeff Derevensky from McGill University, as well as the Emerging Research Leader Sasha Stark, also from Canada, currently working at GRIO. That's going to be a really interesting conversation. So please make sure you register and attend that. Please share this with anyone you know who might be interested. All the episodes are available via YouTube to catch up uh, on demand. And the more people we have registered, the more support we can see, the more likely we are to keep going. Please do share any thoughts and comments about people you'd like to see featured or topics you want us to talk about. Uh, thank you again to the Brain and Mind Centre and Harrison Shine, who's been doing all the background work behind the scenes and for all everyone who uh, commented and listened live or after the fact. Uh, this will be, next week will be the last uh, of the season and for a little couple of weeks, we're going to take a break over the holidays, but we do have much more lined up. So, so register, share,